Hello and welcome to the Dallas Design Sprints podcast. My name is Robert Scrove. On today's show, we have Douglas Strubel. He's a product designer and design sprint facilitator out of California. We're going to be talking about all things design sprints, product design, his background in education, and his interest with taking design sprints into education and politics. Hope you enjoy the show. Douglas, thanks a lot for coming and talking with me today on the Dallas Design Sprints podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Robert. No problem. So you are a product designer and newly crowned design sprint facilitator. <laughs> uh, you also have a background in teaching through teaching high schoolers and middle schools at Waldorf. And I think I want to start with that. What was your interest in getting involved with teaching in the first place? Well, prior to uh, teaching, I was a designer and it was kind of a lot of pixel pushing. It was problem solving, but there wasn't enough people involved. I you know, I'm, I'm really, I, I love to ask questions. I'm maybe from information. And so um, I, I wanted more interactions with people. And so um, at that time, I was actually um, hosting a salon style tea in my home and a gallery window and kind of having um, collective gatherings and presentations and the like. And that really fed me. So I was looking to kind of create an environment or be, you know, a teacher in an environment where I can uh, facilitate people's learning and to, you know, be ringmaster if that's what it need be in, in regards to like, you know, bringing um, information or knowledge to people and, and really, um, you know, cognitive science and understanding how people tick and, and just wanting to know and communicate with people. And so, um, so because I wasn't really finding that in design, um, I went into um, education. So did the topics that you went in when you were at Waldorf, did they cover design in some aspect or did you switch, did you switch topics or subject matter completely once you had gotten into a teaching uh, role? Well, one of the benefits of being a Waldorf teacher is you teach everything. So I was teaching art. Um, I taught a little bit of design. It's a portfolio based, um, uh, I guess the lessons are portfolio based. So there's drawing and there's writing that are all collected together in what's a main lesson book. So as far as like designing how those pages looked or where they were in relationship to each other, I mean, I guess that would be quote graphic design, but um, mostly I was designing the lessons and understanding how to bring those lessons. I mean, how do you teach sixth graders about the Roman history and how do you design that lesson? I mean, you could, you could go on and, you know, talk, talk about the 500 years of the Roman Empire, but you want to understand, and there's, of course, there's highlights in the Roman Empire that you want to talk to, like the death of Julius Caesar, etc. But the kids actually tell you, it's a, there's a feedback loop that's there. So you're kind of designing based on the, the feedback and what's resonating with the students in the class. And that was what I was really drawn to in regards to Waldorf education, because it, it's, um, it brings it alive. And, it, and it's based on the feedback that you're getting from the students and what they're interested in, you know, and you can kind of tailor the, the lesson to meet their needs, interests, and wants so that they're engaged. And it's not just a boring remembering of dates and, you know, names of leaders and this and that. So it, it enlivens it. So, so what's really interesting is that you, you came from a graphic design and production artist background with working for different agencies and companies for close to 10 years. I mean, it looks like you started this around uh, the, just around the start of the century. And yeah. you're doing stuff for eBay, you were kind of, you know, designing magazines and print ads and marketing collateral. And then you, when you went to Waldorf, you suddenly shifted into math, science, language arts, history, geography, and all of that. But what, yeah. what I hear you saying is that you kind of took the same approach of kind of uh, collaborate on the ads, on the agency side, you collaborate with clients. Now with Waldorf, you were actually collaborating with students and kind of getting yeah. that feedback loop from what they're after and how they're how they how they they're what kind of um, subject matter expert or subject subjects they're interested in. Sure, sure. And the nature of the Waldorf curriculum is really developmentally based, so it's meeting what they're interested in. You know, every sixth grader is a little Roman, <laughs> a little bit, and so um, you know, understanding that and seeing the genius that's in the curriculum, so. It's, it's honestly, I think when I was in design, one of the things that did intrigue me and I liked about it, and I think it's uh, still true today, is in branding, for example, it's the storytelling. And even UX design, it's the storytelling. 
And so that storytelling is really a large part of how you bring the lessons that are there. And that storytelling is interactive activity where you're, you can see your audience and if they're reacting to this part of the story or that part of the story. And of course, there's crucial parts to tell them, but it's really important that they're engaged and, 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 um, and interested in what you're talking about. So those elements of design that I really enjoyed were the storytelling parts or the meetings with the clients to understand or solving problems or making artistic and beautiful things. So um, those translated well into education. You know, it was solving problems. It was working with multiple stakeholders because, you know, there's not just the students involved. There's the parents as well. And my first, you know, entry into um, education was through admissions direction. So I was, you know, solving people's problems. They were coming to Waldorf education for varying reasons of why they wanted their students to go there or why they, as parents, were interested in the culture of the school and the community that was there. So um, so it, it just, um, it fed on all the things that I liked as far as like problem solving and storytelling and, and building a, an engaging relationship with people and communicating. And fast forward to 2017, the summer of 2017 mm -hmm. specifically, and it looks like you start getting involved with UX design. Mm -hmm. uh, you had some initial work with Heartwood Education, Educational Collaborative. Sure, uh, sure. Working with some of those folks on redesigning a school website and the company brand, going right into, uh, it looks like Block. You, you basically started full-time UX design work. Tell me a little bit about that transition from where you sure. were in Waldorf work and then what brought you into UX. Certainly. Well, it actually began a little bit earlier than that. It happened in 2015 when I went to General Assembly. And as I was graduating in eighth grade class, um, I realized that, I, that it, the design itch was not getting scratched. I mean, it was amazing. I had an amazing experience teaching those kids. But I really wanted to move back into design. And honestly, I was looking at my peers that I was de been designing along with before I entered into <clears throat> teaching or into education. And they were designing. And one of them introduced me to UX design because he was a UX designer. He's now a UX designer at Google. And um, when I found UX design, I'm like, wow, this is what was missing. The people, <laughs> the storytelling, the things that I, all those elements and the, the research that was there. And it just seemed um, such a match for what I was missing and why I went from design into education. And and meeting other UX designers and having conversations about this and going through General Assembly and then into Block. It was like I had found my tribe. I had found these people that were, that had this empathy and these soft skills and that they had to understand the marketing and they had to understand the design and that it was a process that was, um, it wasn't just the deliverable. It's how you got to the deliverable. And, um, and I, I don't know, it was like I had found, I, I, it wasn't there when I had entered teaching and then once I was ready to leave, I found you know, UX design and product design, and <clears throat> it was speaking to all the wants and needs that I, I had um, initially. So from your standpoint, what do you think is the difference between user experience and product design? Product design, it seems to me, um, is about, I think it's a little bit higher level. UX is, UX is it, well, there's user research that's there, and that's kind of understanding. Um, the motivations of the people and setting the stage and setting the framework and and trying to get into the mindset of the people and then there's the process of information architecture and how that's going to meet and maybe the ui of what's um in ux product design it seems to me is the reason i'm more interested in product design than quote ux is ux is such a huge it's kind of like design thinking and uh design sprints in my opinion you know UX design is this huge panacea, and depending on who you talk to as far as like what UX is, it can mean a million things. Some people think it's the, you're a coder, that's a designer, that's a researcher. Um, some think it's, oh, well, you're a designer that knows marketing. Some think it's this, some think it's that. And so with product design, what I really had found is that it's process oriented, and it's about asking questions like, why are we doing this? And who are our audience? And how can we support them and keeping them at top of mind? And when I went through the design uh, or the UX design training, one of the things that was a huge aha for me was to see that the user, the user testing, like that was the gold, that the kind of interaction 
with the user with the product that that data that information was really what all the UX was about um, and you know smart people can use their 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 intelligence to make smart decisions but it might not be what the user wants and just having that you know once it's put in the wild you get that feedback loop that really creates amazing data and 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 I think that the uh, the product design process is very much aimed at that of, of holding the priorities defining the audience and um, understanding the context of the the user's needs um, and then trying you know several ideas and you know with UX it seemed a, a little bit misty <laughs> as far as like what exactly is this process? How do, how do you work? What do you use when? And it's not that I need, you know, a rote um, process, but I think it's often misunderstood, whereas I think product design is pretty clear and is using a lot more, I think, in the research, the marketing, and it has to have an understanding of both the business priorities as well as the user's priorities and kind of overlaying those, where I think UX designers can get lost in the user a little bit and and lose sight that they're actually creating something that's in a market and um, is you know needs to be monetized somewhat or is um, it's a product it's a thing it's something that's going to be hopefully used by the user and that's who you need to keep at top of mind but it's there's a more complex um, picture let's stay on user testing for just a second uh, mm -hmm. in the past I've heard you say that user testing is a perfect way of getting people out of their in, inherent biases and mm -hmm. also to get them aligned uh, on, on, a, on, a, on, on an understandable truth or at least on the beginning on the same page. Can you kind of mm -hmm. dive into that a little bit, how you, how you see user testing kind of facilitating both of those things? Well, I saw it all the time. Um, I saw it all the time in design or in agency work is where the the owners of a product or the owners of, of uh, a business or whatever are kind of get trapped in their own internal biases where like, oh yeah, this is great, this is great, we think this is great, and then it goes into the world and it's not great or it's not, it doesn't, people don't react to it or, or understand it or it's an inside joke and such an inside joke that people don't really understand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, designers often will create these amazing, beautiful things, but no one really likes it or wants to look at it because it's beautiful to the designer crew, the, the group of designers that they had. And so the foundation of UX design and product design that I see is really about, and design sprints for that fact, is really to, to have someone outside the bubble look at what you're doing and using that data versus the justifications of the people within it, which are going to be biased, to really understand what the truth is. And, you know, I think it's the nature of what is the truth. Is it the relative truth that everyone in the, in the circle sees? And, or is this um, the truth of the user? Or is this the truth of the person that's going to be using this product? Or, um, and, and those data points, um, for me, was the goal that I saw when I was, you know, uh, doing user testing is, is um, you know, re re quote, reality will, will give you, um, what you need if you ask the right questions and you're asking questions that are not based on the inherent bias of and mutual understanding of the people within the, the circle, so to speak. How have you historically managed confirmation bias on the part of the moderator of user testing? One of the things I see every so often with design sprints is a, a real inherent need for those who aren't really versed in user research to confirm the findings of the of say like a design sprint team that's working on a problem for three or four days, mm -hmm. uh, how have you approached that that issue? Well, I think it has to do with the person that's you know giving the test. How talented are they? How empathetic are they? Um, and how are they formulating those questions? Um, where they're not giving them the answer, or they're not. I mean, in many ways, it feels, when I've done this, it feels much more like being a teacher, where you know, you're, you're leading them to what they need to do, but you're not telling them how to do it. And often the, the user will be apologetic or want to know the answer. What's the answer? Well, you know, the, what would you do? Or how, you know, turning it back onto the user of it. And, and I think that's not, um, that's, that's a skill. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, I think 
it's really important that the user tester um, or the person who's running the user tester that's in the room with the people, the one-on-one -on -one people, has a high EQ and has the ability to, um, it sounds silly maybe, but a little bit of a magician, like, you know, don't, it's not that you're direct, you're directing their attention like a magician would do, but you're not telling them how you do the trick or you're not telling them, you know, push the button and then that'll go to this one thing and, and dealing with people's frustration and um, being able to know when is an, enough because sometimes people just, they can't get out of that frustration and move on to the next topic unless they're directed outside. So it's that, it's that dance to be able to read the person who's doing the testing and, and as a tester, understand what are the larger um, uh, goals um, that they're working towards in this test. And currently, right now, you're, you're acting as a product designer for your own company, Struble Design, and you've been working yeah. on mobile apps, websites, game design projects, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, what have you found has been your, your ideal audience for what you do? What, what kind of clientele have you been attracting, and, and where are you kind of targeting your efforts? Um, I'm interested in um, agency work and working with um, ed tech, med tech. Um, what else? Um, basically, I want to, for me, what's really important with the project is that it's, it's actually helping people or that it's producing something that's going to be of benefit to the users. Um, and that's a pretty large swath because, you know, it, the sector, it could be in fintech, it could be in, 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 in banking. Um, really, but what's important to me is that it's really helping somebody. Um, I did a game specifically because I was interested in gamification and seeing how that kind of hacks the, cogn you know, the cognitive abilities of people and what's really working. And, and it's honestly, it's things that I've, it's techniques that I've seen also work in the classroom, but I really wanted to understand that process because I can, I can see that there are uh, methods that are there and things that are there that can really help people. So I, I don't know. I really would like to create things that are of benefit to people versus just another way to purchase a t-shirt or um, uh, or selling selling some marketing story to them. If you if you had an ideal project that you wanted to line yourself up for in like say the first quarter of 2019, mm -hmm. describe what that project's like and how would that really uh, not only speak to your strengths but also speak to your your professional background. Sure. I mean, I would like to produce, I think that <clears throat> um, an online tool would be fantastic, you know, working for um, a company that's building a tool for people to use that to either create or build something or to learn something, um, a, a lesson. And I think that's a little bit different of a product cycle in regards to, you know, what are the user's concerns here? What are they trying to do? And it, it seems to be a little bit harder of a problem. Um, because you, it's the feedback loop, you know, you need to understand, well, what are people using this for and where are they hitting snags? So for me, I, I'm very interested in building tools, you know, um, so any kind of tool for a person to, not just to help them, but to help them make something. So it's kind of like a, a product design tool per se, or are you talking more or less in the education realm, something like uh, Khan Academy or LinkedIn or... Uh, lend it right. up, something like that. I mean, where, what, which vein of, of uh, application are you thinking about? Well, it could be a product design tool, but I think in, I mean, it's in the nature of like, when I was a teacher, I was teaching the kids to make tools to help them learn what it is that they were going to learn. So um, be it the drawing or the writing or like, you know, understanding what they're doing or the topic that they're doing or they're studying. Um, and they would produce amazing um, methods or tools to do that and helping them facilitate facilitating those tools or facilitating that process was really satisfying to me. One of the things that I'm working on too actually is the Design Sprint Referral Network, which is what you worked on this past mm -hmm. November, we'll get into in a second. But the other is, is that I'm going to be doing that virtual Design Sprint event again in April. So mm -hmm. beyond uh, doing client work for my own business, those are two projects that I'm going to be heavily involved with. And I'm actually writing an article right now on the referral network to pitch the basic premise of it, which is essentially what your team kind of explored in the virtual sprint we did in November, mm -hmm. which is 
not only finding the right people for your design sprint, but connecting, uh, you know, educators with potential facilitators and kind of seeing where those two groups kind of come together. Mm -hmm. um, for, for your own work for that November week, what were some of the highlights that you had kind of uh, seen and experienced with going through the virtual design sprint? For those who, for those who are listening don't know what we're talking about. We had a pilot to see if getting a lot of people from, in Douglas's case, uh, around the Americas that were, had never known each other before, but basically grouped them together and brought them together for a common uh, challenge, you know, what would they, A, would they come together and B, what would, would the virtual design sprint process work in that regard? And uh, Douglas came on board and basically said, opted in as a facilitator with me doing some assists where needed. And he and his team, and I think Douglas, you produced the design on this. Yes. You produced a <clears throat> representation of what that design sprint referral network was, was like. So queuing that up for you, uh, give me some of the highlights of that week. Uh, what kinds of things you learned? And uh, what, from your standpoint, what do you think that vision of the design sprint referral network could be? Sure. Um, well, really, it was connecting with those people and the diversity of the opinions that came to the table and the, the skill sets and perspectives was really, truly amazing and really lifted the project to another level that just working on maybe a team of one or two would not have done. Um, I also think that uh, um, working through a screen was in actually very interesting to me and being able to to not have them all necessarily in the same room but all, all on the same screen and working with them that way and um, the time zone difference was actually intriguing too. So you, you trying out the process gave you a new perspective on not only approaching the work but also being able to collaborate with people online. Mm -hmm. Normally in design sprints historically have been where you lo localize everybody in one single space mm -hmm. and they work together on a common problem with the idea that they test it later on. Uh, I guess you've answered pretty much everything except the last, which is when you think of the, what the work on the design sprint referral network and the feedback you had gotten from the testers that we had lined up, um, what, what would be your approach to that? Because I'm going to be working on it. So I'd love to hear from you here. What do you have to say? Well, I think trust was really important as far as like being able to trust the referrals that were going on there. And I think a big takeaway as well was that it would be an opt-in or you'd be invited into that circle versus just kind of putting it out there. Um, and that, you know, it was a relationship builder. So it was, you know, c c it was connecting those people so that they could collaborate. So the level of trust and the kind of like, uh, like, how do you know that they can do design well? How do you know this user testing is worth their salt? You know, that can be from practical experience that you've worked with them before or that you can refer them to another person. But I think kind of the matrix of how you would go about um, qualifying those people um, was based on the trust and the knowledge of, and the real life experience that those users had with each other as the, the indicator to, you know, bring them in the circle and work with them or connect them with others. Yeah, basically having, having real experience being the underpinning connection between various individuals with different layers of connections kind of layering on top of that. But that was the, the fundamental one is that you had a first impression of the person that you had worked with on the project. And you can probably give an idea, say, of David Hall, who worked with you. What were some standout qualities about him? Uh, uh, there was the, um, Richard forget his last name, Richard, mm -hmm. I forget, I, I, but Richard was a part of at t research. Right. And there were certain things that he brought to the table where if you, if someone said, well, what's so special about Richard, you could say, well, he did this and, or he was, he was, he brought this. Uh, Benoit was another person. Um, but all of them pretty much had some, some aspect to them that you could probably describe for other people to mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of design sprints in general, um, you we spoke before and you have an interest in kind of bringing design sprints into politics as well as the classroom. And you kind of like mm -hmm. to kind of concentrate on that going forward. Can mm -hmm. you kind of expound on both of those, those disciplines and how you'd like to kind of apply the design sprint process to each? 
Sure, sure. Well, I think it gets back to the earlier idea of like creating a tool or working with a tool and design sprints are a fantastic tool for solving really kind of sticky or complicated problems um, and aligning everybody and moving forward towards uh, the solutions and the best solution that'll work um, for the circumstances. So, you know, and I just know from being in education that there's, you know, multitude of um, sticky problems that need to be solved that have real and true um, cultural impacts in regards to, you know, educating children and how that is the future and how important that is and that it is forward looking that the quote mistakes and or uh, um, lessons that you learn in education are going to be affecting the students that are going to be at that institution or, or in that education system and, and what that's going to you know, the seeds of that are going to be blooming into the future. So it's, I think it's really important that you're providing the teachers and those institutions with the tools that they need. And I think design sprints are a perfect um, tool for that environment to create a great learning experience and a great uh, learning community of people to make a better future. So educating educators on the process. Correct. And having them build an institution that is based on the needs of the students and the needs of the teachers and and to solve those problems because you know the problems that you'll find in education today are not the problems that you'll find in education 20 years ago even 10 years ago or even five years ago um, you know there's a lot that's changing in education and the the system of education that we have now is primarily based from the industrial revolution or in the industrial age. So it, there's a lot of update, updating and new ideas and, and methods that need to be kind of uh, figured out and, and worked on. And I believe that design sprints are a tool for doing that. Um, and I, you know, along those lines, I think that's why in politics as well that I'm interested in going in that realm too, because it's much the same thing that, you know, they're working on creating rules and laws and, you know, uh, a government that is, meeting the people's needs and building a future that isn't you know dire but supportive to people and for people and and um can do really you know great and important things and like i said they have the same thing that that's in education they have issues that are really difficult to solve and they have problems just like in teaching getting them out, out of their own biases um so that they can see you know what is the real here what is the truth and and how can we make decisions based on those data points versus what we think should be done. And I think that those two uh, areas, education and, and in politics, that design sprints are, would be an incredible tool. That would is, there a, is there a particular role in the design sprint process that you kind of align with more than, so than others? Like, since you have a, a background in design and research, Mm -hmm. uh, do you have an interest in those per se more so than facilitation or are you agnostic in the sense that you could pretty much handle any one of them depending on what the uh, circumstance allowed? Sure. I think I could do all of them really. Um, but what I like to do is I'm a pe <laughs> people are my jam. People are my thing. I really like to like work with people. So facilitation is a large part of why I was attracted to doing design sprints because I get to work with people and get to see those aha moments. And for me, it's very much a reflection of what it is to be a teacher. Um, and so facilitation specifically and kind of the organization that's behind being that facilitator and what that looks like in the, in the interviews that you have with the experts or kind of the pre-work that you would do there. So anything facilitation um, is, is what I love to do. And then on the other end of that, I think that the the user tests testing is something that I very much like to do because it's one on one and I work really well one on one with people and sorry about that and people want to talk to you right now about that yes they do apparently they do um, I really like to work with people one on one and I and user testing is I think a kind of a fine art in regards to you know, asking people what they need. And, and it reminds me of like, again, being in the classroom and teaching things where, where the, the students would want the answer and you have to lead them to the answer without telling them the answer maybe, but, um, and be able to kind of actualize my empathy skills in being able to read those subtle cues um, of that person's confusion or frustration and 
or when we've reached the threshold where they're so frustrated they can't like even begin to think what's next or they feel at ease and so so that user testing is is also um for me i enjoy doing that because i like i said I like to work with people but but my background is in design so i can also do that i can also work and manage designers i know the design tools i understand that i um, i'm an artist and i'm a designer and so i have that you know um uh sensibility that i can use there but um yeah so i would say that anything that is deals with more with the people is where I would, I'm, I'm drawn to working with people. Great. And if people wanted to, if those people wanted to find out more about you and what you're doing, where would they go? They would go to Struble Design. My last name is Struble. It's S-T-R-U-B-L-E dot design, D-E-S-I-G-N, design. Struble Desi Struble dot design, and they can find, um, case studies and my work and um, everything about me. Great. Well, Douglas, thank you very much for talking with me today. It was great talking to you about your background and everything you're interested in, and I hope we get a chance to work again. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Robert, for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Thanks again for listening to the Dallas Design Sprints podcast. If you have a question or comment about what you heard on today's show, email me direct at robert at dallasdesignsprints.com. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next time.